Uh, we're, we're really fortunate and excited today to have with us uh, Dr. Paolo Gobaldo um, from King's, um, who's going to be talking to us, uh, I believe, about some, some extracts and some content from his new book, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so the usual housekeeping applies uh, for around 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A. Uh, feel free to pop up on the screen to ask those questions, gives us more of an in-person audience vibe. Um, and then uh, equally, if, if you're busy or can't have your camera on, uh, questions in the chat are fine and I will field those. Um, whilst Paolo is speaking, feel free to have cameras um, off or on, but when we do the questions, cameras on is nice again, so we have a, a sense of an audience there. Um, the seminar is being recorded today, so just, just be aware of that if you have any questions or concerns cameras off is probably the way to go um, and with without any further ado I will hand over to Paolo please take it away hi everyone thanks very much Rachel thanks very much Christian thanks very much everyone for uh, inviting me and for uh, being here today uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, present uh, uh, some of my new work uh, to this group uh, and, and as you say know many colleagues uh, working in their uh, lab world and uh, and the work you're doing uh, uh, on different aspects of media and politics and knowing also that some of you are working on, on discourse right on political discourse and, and media discourse i thought it would be uh, a good idea to share some of my new work which is in fact very much on uh, the change in political discourse the change in political discourse we have been experiencing in recent years and the change in the ideological horizon we have been experiencing in recent years. I mean, in recent years, meaning uh, really since during the 2010s, but more markedly really since the pandemic uh, crisis and the beginning, uh, the rather rocky beginning of the 2020s we are experiencing, where I think many of the tenets of uh, uh, political discourse that people our age in a way took for granted as we were brought up uh, through these changes are now significantly changing and are now significantly reshaping uh, what we could describe as the field of, of uh, political antagonisms right they're not reshaping just uh, one camp or one ideology but they are in a way reshaping the entire uh, horizon Right, the entire uh, political horizon, inflecting both the left uh, and the right. And central to all these uh, is uh, uh, precisely the, the term that I uh, have in, in, in the abstract and I have in this title, with the idea of protection. I think that protection can be taken as a sort of uh, a master signifier of this new uh, political scenario as a term that uh, is used frequently in all sorts of, of policy areas uh, ranging from health to uh, ecology to the environment to the economy uh, to minorities uh, to migration and a term which obviously has very different connotations and uh, denotations according to the context in which it is applied <laughs> but i think that its preeminence, its almost obsessive uh, uh, reappearance in any context, bespeaks a redefinition of social priorities and of the axes of, of political discourse. So this is content that is uh, part of my forthcoming book, uh, which will be out in, in July uh, with, with Verso. Uh, the Great Recoil, Politics After Populism and, and Pandemic. So just a few words about the book project. Uh, this book has been one that has been through a very long gestation uh, to look at populism, right, and the ideology of populism. But ever since it went into kind of uh, an evolution where the kind of final product is more of a reflection on the triad neoliberalism, populism, and neo-statism. It's very much on the return of the state, on, on the return of, of the interventionist state and of an imaginary of uh, the need for state support, which I think goes a long way to understand some of the changes we have been experiencing. 
Methodologically, it's uh, discourse analysis. Fundamentally, it's an analysis of various speeches, documents, declarations, uh, manifestos, um, uh, propaganda by political parties and politicians, the language they use, the terminology they use, the kind of imaginary they are invoking. And the theory behind it uh, fundamentally is that we are approaching, we are seemingly approaching a post neoliberal era in the sense that you know, in recent years, there's been many attempts to say we are still in neoliberalism. It is just a different kind of neoliberalism. It is authoritarian neoliberalism. It is punitive neoliberalism. It is austerity neoliberalism, right? To account for the fact that many things in our political landscape we're not corresponding anymore strictly to the idea of neoliberalism as a free market doctrine uh, fueled by possessive individualism, right? But we're introducing other elements that were verging off from the kind of uh, uh, original neoliberal project. My claim is that instead we, are, we have entered a neo-statist era in which both the left and the right and the center are rearranging their uh, policies and their position to adapt to this new condition, right? Now, neo-statist doesn't mean good, right? Though, I mean, many people on the left would assume that is. Uh, it's more of a matter of the fact that because of the crisis, the systemic crisis we, we are uh, finding, we, we are experiencing, the return of the interventionist state is accepted as a necessity from different political camps who, however, strongly disagree on what the state should do. I, I mean, on the right, there is a protectionist statism that, that focuses on property and identity. Basically, it wants to protect the national community based on ethnocultural terms, and it wants to protect property, it wants to protect the capitalist class vis-a-vis -vis foreign competition, while on the left we have <clears throat> what I describe as a social protectivism, in which there is a renewed focus on fundamental social protective functions, such as health, such as education, uh, such as the basic social safety nets, right? that whose importance has been rediscovered also because of the pandemic and fundamentally an attempt to envision a social project around the idea of protection and social protection more specifically. So this is just a kind of general uh, summary of, of the book uh, mission just to give you a sense of the context of this. The book basically has a lot of political philosophy content in it. I mean, many of the chapters are about key concepts such as sovereignty, protection and control. Going back to uh, classic philosophy, uh, ancient Greek philosophy, um, Hobbes, Machiavelli and so on and so forth. And using this, these, um, these works to understand contemporary political discourse, statements by the likes of Trump, Biden, Johnson, uh, you name it, I mean, the main protagonist. Right? And indeed, one of the key concepts there is protection. What does it mean in politics protection? And fundamentally, why are we encountering protection at every corner of contemporary political discourse? And finally, third question, what are the different meanings that protection can be assigned on the political chessboard according to the party, to the force that is mobilizing the term protection. So I think that by now, after 12 months of pandemic, I think this is really the time uh, last year when in Britain people realized there was a pandemic, that there was a We have become acquainted with the discourse of in terms of response to the pandemic. I mean, here is a, a Spanish a poster, right, to raise awareness about the pandemic. Me protejo, te protejo. I protect myself and I protect you. And this is very much the kind of um, the identical discourse that we've seen in every country, right? Paolo, sorry, sorry to interrupt for a second. For a second. Yeah. We are seeing, we are seeing your, slides your slides as in, a, in, a, in a, um, editing, a, editing, editing mode rather than in slideshow mode. mode. 
it's one of those perks that Teams has. Um, uh, all right, so perhaps like this, let me see. I think if you go to, yeah, that's, that's it. All yes. right, perfect. Um, okay, so now it, it, it is flashing on my screen, but <laughs> I'll try to cope with that. Uh, so, I mean, and this is almost the identical discourse we've seen in every country, right? I mean, and I think it's really interesting in a sense. I mean, this protect yourself and protect others, which in a way reveals the very logic of um, action against the pandemic in the sense that there is an element of reciprocity, right? In fact, as you will know, masks, especially in the less advanced masks, say, do very mm, do more to protect others than to protect you, right? But if everyone uses them, ultimately everyone is protected. And I think this is something that is, uh, uh, in a way, really embedded in our history and in, in, in our social unconscious as human groups, because we've been through such things for a very long time, right? Uh, that in a way, by protecting others, you are protecting yourself. But it's something that in a way, in the times of uh, triumphant market doctrine, of neoliberalism, open markets, uh, competitive individualism, was very much erased, as it were, from, from social perception or from social consciousness. Think about the podium from which Boris Johnson is delivering his press updates, right? Protect the NHS. This is the thing that is constantly uh, proposed, right? The idea that we need to protect the institution that protects us in order to save lives, right? So this language of uh, protection, defense, uh, safeguarding, uh, um, this discussion of, of uh, the politics of I mean, defending lives, right? Defending survival, I think is quite interesting <clears throat> as it is not something that is limited to the pandemic. I think, in, in fact, what is interesting about the pandemic is the way in which it has uh, performed a demonstration effect, uh, forcing <laughs> public opinion to look at many other policy challenges from the vantage point of what the pandemic revealed. And fundamentally, what the pandemic revealed <clears throat> is a that uh, the kind of hopes of continuous growth continuous accumulation are very much in doubt secondly that societies face systemic challenges in maintaining what they already have right this is a i think to me it was a very revealing quote by spanish prime minister pedro sanchez when in march i think on the 22nd of march in one of the first uh, press conferences during the pandemic, he literally said, in the past, we always struggled to get more, while now, with this emergency, we find our ourselves fighting to maintain what we already had and what we always took for granted, right? And, and to me, that was really revealing in a way of what the uh, debate and what the challenges now are. Because again, this is not something limited to, to the pandemic only, but also climate change. I mean, climate change poses uh, serious challenges in terms of maintaining the current levels of food production, for example, in terms of maintaining the current levels of, of quality of life, of uh, prosperity, uh, of economic output for many countries. And therefore, in a way, in this context, it is quite obvious that the idea of protection that is ultimately preserving the current level of civilization, though obviously making it more equal, more sustainable, more just, becomes more the idea of an ever-expanded capitalist system that aims primarily at incrementing quantitatively its uh, grasp and its uh, scale. So protection is an idea that is fundamental to political philosophy. And to me, it was quite interesting how unfamiliar it is to us now, uh, in contradiction with the fact that it was very familiar to the likes of Plato, to the likes of Aristotle. It is no coincidence that in Plato and Aristotle, politicians are called guardians. 
And in the Republic, Plato says that the primary function of the city, of the polity, is to guarantee the protection of citizens. What politics has to do is guarantee people's life, people's property, people's existence. Right. And this was obvious in ancient times because uh, uh, cities were always constantly exposed to external threats, first and foremost, uh, threats represented by war, right, which were all too frequent in ancient Greece, and where the experience of cities that had been uh, completely sucked and destroyed with their people disappearing from, from history uh, or uh, right, being, being enslaved, fundamentally disappearing as a people with its own uh, uh, political autonomy, was a cautionary tale for many other polities about the fact that the primary uh, uh, imperative for any polity is to preserve itself, is to guarantee its permanence, its continuity, its self-reproduction. In Hobbes, protection is equally central to the political architecture because for Hobbes, politics is fundamentally about an exchanging kind, an exchanging kind between protection and obedience. The sovereign, no, citizens offer their obedience. The sovereign in turn offers protection. Citizens' obedience to authority is contingent on the protection offered by the sovereign, One, which means that once the sovereign is not able to deliver protection, citizens are authorized to take protection in their own arms. They are not uh, bound anymore by the social contract which means that they need to obey to authority. So now when people think about protection, I mean, and, and another example that, that we'll also raise there is the case of Alexander Hamilton, right? One of the US founding fathers who in the Federalist Papers says that the primary goal of any community is guaranteeing the safety of citizens. So it really, Across political philosophy, there is this consensus that the primary purpose of politics is protecting. The question, though, is that what it means protecting takes radically different meanings at different points of the political spectrum. I think for many people on the left, the language of protection, the imaginary of protection, conjures up the vision of an authoritarian and uh, uh, conservative politics. Uh, one that sets boundaries between the community and what is outside of the political community, which are invariably bound to fuel a kind of politics of resentment or a politics of uh, chauvinism and mutual suspicion and rivalry among nations. I mean, here the most obvious case is the politics of immigration, right, in recent years in, in, in Europe and the way in which the populist right has very much framed immigration as an external threat that uh, led people of foreign origin, foreign background to enter the, um, the nation, to enter the space of the, of the political community without the political community really wanting these people to enter. So this imaginary there of invasion, right? Uh, and this is why the most resonant pictures of immigration have been this landing on, on, on beaches, though these statistically are a minority, right, of the uh, ways in which migrants actually migrate, but they have... Uh, Uh, dramatized, right, this idea of immigration as, as an invasion. But then, obviously, protection comes in many different forms and uh, in other forms on other policy areas that are very much, uh, very much related to progressive politics. I mean, one case is the case of climate change policy, which involves a number of protective functions and protective processes. 
I mean, you may have seen this famous meme um, that was, uh, uh, as, all, as happens with all memes, was uh, remixed and transformed. Initially, it shows it showed two waves, the wave of COVID-19 and then uh, the wave of, of the recession, and then people remixed it, adding climate change and biodiversity collapse behind it. And what this uh, meme uh, really uh, captures is this perception that we are facing a perilous time in which dealing with external threats will very much become the focus of politics. In a way, bringing to the extreme some of the predictions already made by Ulrich Beck in 1986 with his book on the risk of society, uh, where he discussed uh, radiation, where he discussed pollutants, where he discussed the toxins in food. But now it is not just <coughs> dealing with, <coughs> excuse me, with risks that are the side effects of wealth creation, it is dealing with systemic threats. Right, which really put a stake, if not the survival of humanity, as proposed by groups such as Extinction Rebellion, whose narrative perhaps verges too much on the apocalyptic, uh, but definitely the maintenance of the present model of civilization. I mean, the maintenance in particular of democratic capitalism, namely the strange marriage between uh, um, capitalist economics uh, and mass democracy. This discourse of protection also applies to economics, obviously. I mean, one interesting trend in recent years is how economic protectionism that was long seen as a heresy, long seen as something completely irrational and bespeakable, is making a comeback in policy discussions. And this is not just the case of Donald Trump and the trade war on China, the famous tariffs war that many people thought that ultimately was unsuccessful and counterproductive. Ultimately, also Joe Biden, who is a liberal and is uh, in favor of a recuperation of multilateralism, has demonstrated uh, uh, from the campaign, but also in office, that he has actually a protectionist orientation. Uh, think about the Buy American public procurement rules introduced by Biden, which means that uh, um, uh, authorities, local, uh, state level and federal, will have to purchase all their services and goods from American companies, regardless of whether these goods and services have a higher price than uh, goods and services available on a global market. This is uh, an indirect form of protectionism, in a sense that you are not blocking, you're not imposing tariffs on foreign goods, but you are subsidizing fundamentally, um, normatively, uh, using regulation uh, the goods and services produced locally with the aim of constructing an economy that is more uh, bottom heavy in a way, that is more localized, where the extremes of global supply chains are balanced and where, to use a capitalist term that I, uh, I mean, a, a term very in vogue in capitalist discussions, which I think very much captures this uh, neo-protectionist moment, um, moving towards an economic model that allows for more for more resilience, right? I mean, you will have heard, I'm sure, this term uh, at every corner. I mean, I think it is very interesting that also in business circles, the uh, focus is not any more expansion, but the focus is resilience, namely the ability of systems to rebound after uh, traumas, after moments of shock which very much expresses the awareness also on the part of the capitalist class that the major challenge faced by the economy at this stage is its fragility, it is the extreme fragility that is the byproduct of the agility that has been long recommended in the sense by uh, gurus with uh, uh, quite problematic effects in terms of the new risks that this agility has brought about. So when it comes to climate change, one can think about, um, for example, the discussion about climate uh, uh, adaptation, uh, the fact that uh, we will need to build uh, new infrastructures, we need to build coastal defenses, coastal dunes, uh, 
to defend, for example, beaches from, from erosion, from rising sea levels, the need for reinforcement of existing infrastructure in face of ever more extreme climate events, which means that roads, bridges, uh, the various infrastructures allowing uh, transportation and so on and so forth are not fit for purpose vis-a-vis -vis the brutality of uh, the uh, weather events we are going to face. And uh, uh, this discourse also applies to, to social protection. I mean, as Carpolani, uh, the economic historian, clearly showed, societies at times of crisis display such a thing as a self-protection instinct. They tend to uh, act in such a way as to defend themselves from capitalist rapacity, which becomes ever more unbearable precisely at times of crisis when profit margins are shrinking and therefore entrepreneurs need to be uh, more aggressive in the way in which they are extracting profits from society. And in this situation, we can better understand the debate that is going on in different countries, right? Some countries have been forced to reinstate social protection or safety net mechanism. Think about the forload program in the UK, not out of benevolence, but out of the fear of citizens' disobedience, right? Because as we've seen before, as Obs, Obs has clearly explained, citizens are going to obey only as long as they feel protected. And that's why politicians have instated with large consensus social measures to avoid um, lack of protection turning into disobedience. And there is now a very interesting discussion going on at all levels about the need for a caring economy, for example, that is the term that uh, Joe Biden has utilized to frame his uh, intervention in terms of childcare, in terms of support, or support for the ill and, and elderly, uh, because of the perception that societies are in a different phase now where it is necessary to guarantee people as the essential condition of self-reproduction. That for a long time were done away with as they look like an obstacle to entrepreneurialism, opportunity, flexibility, as they look like uh, rigid structures, but now whose importance is becoming ever more apparent. Though there are very different ways in which the left is trying to do that and the right is trying to do that. I mean, uh, while the right wants to protect enterprise and wants to protect national identity, it is not really interested in uh, carers, in this caring economy that Joe Biden is speaking about. Just look at the last budget in the UK, where Rishi Sunak has given a miserly 1% pay rise to uh, NHS workers, namely those who protect us and those who we celebrated in the clap for our carers collective rituals uh, in March and April 2020. So it really shows how for the left, the priority is social protection, while for the right, the priority remains uh, protection of property. So to conclude, to me, the image you see here, uh, a pangolin, uh, in a defense posture, I think captures much of the social psychology in our present times. Times in which, as proposed by Polanyi, there is an almost instinctual tendency for society to uh, defend itself from external threats. Now, this is not necessarily a regressive or authoritarian or conservative move. It is not a move that necessarily means excluding fears or expelling migrants. It can also reflect a social need to reestablish basic protection mechanisms that guarantee everyone welfare and security vis-a-vis -vis uncertainty and that guarantee a defense and a maintenance and preservation of the human habitat which is now really the priority in environmental discussions, right? It is not anymore saving polar bears or saving pandas, right? Uh, but it is about maintaining the basic conditions 
allowing for uh, societies uh, uh, to uh, preserve themselves and self-reproduce themselves. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo, for, for an insightful talk. Um, so to open the floor to questions, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, if you want to pop on the screen uh, to ask them, just use the hand up function in Teams. Otherwise, feel free to type anything in the chat um, and uh, we will also feel there. So uh, I guess whilst we wait for, for questions to come in, um, a general kind of thought that I had as you spoke, Paolo, is around mm -hmm. uh, particularly the narrative in the UK just being what I'm most familiar with. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around uh, the fact that the Conservative government have for years been claiming, you know, pushed a policy of austerity. Uh, and then all of a sudden this money has been found to furlough people for a year. Um, so there's been a lot of when but arguably there are ongoing crises of uh, poverty uh, and other issues which are you know just as certainly very threatening um, to many people in the country and yet the same approach isn't taken uh, so covid which is a direct threat to, to lives and livelihoods has been tackled um, with an influx of money and yet various other issues which people could say are, are also devastating to the population are not treated in the same way um so i thought that was an interesting parallel if nothing else <laughs> yeah that is interesting in a sense that i think one of the most significant ideological changes we have been experiencing in britain is an apparent turn away from Os osbornomics right in a sense of uh, um not just austerity, but presenting austerity as a good thing, right? Because it's two different things, right? I mean, from an ideological perspective, one thing is doing, uh, implementing certain policies. Uh, another thing is to uh, be very straightforward about these policies and celebrate them, right? Uh, which was the case, right, in the 2010s, right? We need these, it is, austerity is good, we need to implement that and so on and so forth. So there are so, still some lingering elements of that. And I think uh, in terms of, for example, pay, in which public, the public employer, the state, actually has a very important role in signaling to the broader economy the kind of attitude that it needs to take. So the fact that from, fundamentally there is a pay cut, because in terms of inflation for NHS workers is a pay cut, it signals to the entire economy that uh, wages need to be kept down, which is ultimately an austerity kind of uh, orientation. On the other hand, though, I think what is interesting with the right is the extreme adapting, adaptiveness of the conservative movement. I mean, conservatives are the most uh, uh, innovative, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, uh, force in Western politics, and they have been that for uh, for over a century, for a century and a half. I mean, say for a century since the beginning of mass democracy across Europe. Because in order to conserve, right, social structures, you need to be extremely adaptable to uh, changing conditions. This is what already Michels ultimately said, right? Conservatism was the response to democracy. It was the way to maintain power structures in a context in which you need to fight for consensus. That, that is where the adaptability comes from. Ideological adaptability, you can the very right that imposed on the public, on public discourse, neoliberalism, right? Because it was Thatcher and Reagan that imposed neoliberalism uh, on the policy agenda, is the very same force that was the, fir the first to dispose with it selectively. And I think there are four or five tenets to neoliberalism 
and this includes monetarism, right? Restrictive monetary policy, the idea of balanced budgets, right? Fiscal conservatism, the idea that budgets always need to be balanced, which is counterfactual and counterhistorical because government budgets have never been balanced, except for very few years. And free trade, right? These are three key. I think these are the three key economic tenets of, the, of neoliberalism. Well, the right has done away with most of them. Free trade first with Trump and with Brexit, which is ever more clearly a protectionist project, more than a free trade project. Uh, monetarism. I mean, look what the Bank of England is doing, right? It's printing money. As a famous meme goes, money goes brr, or printer goes brr. They're just printing money as if there is a magic money tree, right? Which, and, and third, also fiscally, you know, like you see Rishi Sunak saying, I'm proud to have all this deficit. Right? Then sh for sure they will retrench at some point and, and they will go, but I think, I think it is still significant. While the left with Keir Starmer and, 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 and Labour in, in, the, in the UK, but I think many other countries, is conserving what the conservatives were trying to conserve 30 years ago, right? So look at the corporation tax or look at the kind of uh, suspicion or, or, or prudence in terms of uh, saying, yes, we need fiscal expansion. Uh, while Joe Biden, I think, is more uh, boldly adopting this new framework, this new status framework, namely the state is not a referee, as Milton Friedman said, the state is a coach and a player. The state needs to directly intervene in the economy, needs to do industrial policy, and it needs to protect society, to kind of misquote Foucault, in the sense that one of the major challenges for society now is security in the sense of social security in the sense that people are constantly preoccupied about what is going to happen tomorrow because they're in a situation of such precarity that they can only have a short-term plan when society actually now needs a long-term plan and the only way to have a long-term plan is to have some security some planning climate targets, what is going to happen in 2030, right? So I think that to me is a very interesting re-jigging of, of the political horizon. Absolutely. Um, yeah, more food for thought there. Uh, we had a hand up, yes. I, I see one just there. Uh, Hi, uh, can you hear me? I, I don't know. Sort of, uh, OK, fantastic. No, th thank you. Thank you, Paula. Really interesting. Um, just a couple of, well, one particular question. I'd just be interested in your thoughts. To what extent COVID and the, the pandemic has accelerated this protectionist, interventionist trend? Mm -hmm. uh, and whether this is kind of, you know, something that's going to, you, I, I, I got a sense, and perhaps you didn't say this, that this is something that conservatives are perhaps not signed up to fully or they want to reverse back at the future. I'm not sure if I'm right and I read that in, in, in your talk, but this isn't a, but actually to what extent are we moving towards a new form of conservatism, which perhaps has much more akin with fascism or something like that, which is the state becomes much more central to the conservative agenda and vision for society. And whether COVID plays into that and you talk about the security, but um, more broadly about social security you know, war on terror, so on and so forth. Yes, f thanks, James. I mean, that is interesting. And I mean, also in terms of predicting, right? I mean, will is this a temporary uh, kind of long cycle kind of uh, um, framework? And specifically, for example, when will they start again speaking about austerity? Right, because uh, uh, that is fundamentally is is the kind of uh, canary in the mine, right? I mean, once they start speaking again about that, would be the time when when some of these things are are set into question again. 
And I think, I mean, for example, at a European level in Germany, they are talking about the debt break, reintroducing the debt break, so-called, which is an extremely restrictive measure. Fundamentally, is a sort of uh, self-restrainment of, of the state that cannot spend more than uh, a given amount, which again, I mean, to me is interesting because it's uh, irrational in the sense that if you look at def uh, state deficits, like going back to the 18th century, you will see that the case is that 90% of the time, the state is in deficit. It is exceptional that the state makes a surplus, which anyone uh, who doesn't, uh, who knows only the kind of uh, house economy or the private economy would say, this is crazy. How does the state manage to, to survive while it is losing every year? And the fact is that the state economy works in the inverse of the private economy, right? It has a central bank, it can print money, right? Which is some of the things that, I mean, some of the useful actually points that have been made by modern monetary theory, which is now very trendy and has inspired Sanders, uh, AOC and others, though some points of modern, modern monetary theory go to the other extreme. I don't know if you have been following this debate. There's been a recent book on the deficit meet. Um, so what modern, modern monetary theory says is that deficits are never a problem and that the state has no fiscal constraints whatsoever. It is like Friedman turned upside down which obviously gets into the opposite problem of Friedman, because it's obvious that this is just a kind of accounting trick, as you were. Um, so, I mean, j just to conclude on, on James' question, I think the Tories cannot go back to Osbornomics if they want to maintain the social bloc they uh, won in 2019 which is a social bloc with a significant working class component. Right. And this is why they are doing investments in the north and so on and so forth. If they want to stick with that social bloc instead of going for a bloc bourgeois, so uniting again the, the two halves of the middle class, if they want to maintain a social bloc, they, they will need to maintain some protectionist and interventionist policies. Thank you. Uh, Christian. Uh, hi, Paolo. Thank you very, very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could um, address the issue of um, cultural conservatism mm -hmm. versus economic conservatism, mm -hmm. because it seemed like a lot of you know what we've talked about so far today has to do with economics. And I, I fully agree with you about the conservatives' ability to transform themselves. Uh, but, you know, we, we might have Rishi Sunak at the Treasury, but we have Preti Patel at the Home Office, who is saying very different things, very conservative things, at least as conservatism has evolved in the last 20 years across the West. Um, and I wonder, especially to your last point, you know, you know, they will need to invest and, you know, level up or whatever they call it. But, you know, they will also probably use a lot of uh, uh, cultural uh, wars to uh, keep that working class group uh, of their voters with them. And I wonder if your framework of protection uh, can apply also to cultural uh, battles and cultural, cultural in a broad sense, of course, you know, about inclusion, about diversity, about tolerance, you know, about all those things that, you know, I think pretty starkly divide progressives and conservatives these days. I agree with you, perhaps much more than economic policies, at least at this point. Thanks very much, Christian. Yes, that is obviously a very important battle, uh, a very important battlefield, and partly cultural wars. And this is something I think Queen's Lobodian in his book on globalist uh, points out, I think, very, very, very persuasively. Why have cultural wars become so important? But why have they now become the decisive battleground for politics. And the point he makes is that in a neoliberal globalized system, as the state is deprived of macroeconomic levers more and more, it is tied more and more right to, to follow an agenda that is already decided by supranational institutions or by market demand and financial systems. Fundamentally, 
the policy range for it, of politics is, is extremely reduced, right? And, and, and politicians find themselves in, in a situation of paralysis where, yes, they can say we're going to do this and this, and they still have some room for maneuver, but it's very reduced. So in a way, politics becomes inevitably disappointing. Instead, with cultural wars, you can do things. And with the repressive apparatus of the state, you can do things that look like political efficacy, right? You can have another blockade. The state can still say, we're not going to let this ship enter the port. And it looks like strength, right? It looks like effectiveness. Or uh, the state can say, we are going to expel all mm, immigrants, whatever. And it can still do it. So I think that's one reason for the effectiveness of the right in recent years, because it is using the lever of the state that actually is still working, right? Uh, on the other hand, I would say there is, uh, yeah, it's very much a question of cultural protection as it is framed in terms of our cohesive elements in society, namely our tradition, our shared values, the things that keep society together, the kind of strong force of physics or the equivalent of that, is being threatened by these people, these elites, as they are often framed, as if people like us in, the, in this room, right, who are introducing foreign elements, and both because they are foreigners, because they may be British, but fundamentally they are cosmopolitans and therefore they are foreign to the nation. And, and it is a very rhetorically effective discourse, right? Um, and I think the real challenge for the left is showing not only that it is able to criticize existing cohesive cultural processes, right? That is able to do the past destruence, but it, that it is able to create new cohesive cultural institutions. Right, of a different kind, right? which I think has been the, a, a long um, challenge for the left, already in the kind of new left. Right? For example, you criticize the family, but then when you try to substitute the commune to the family, the experiment didn't really work, right? as Lash and others. right? Uh, and ultimately, society needs, I think, order of some kind. I mean, this is what Gramsci and others said, right? It, it is about creating a different order, an alternative and more just order. So if that doesn't happen, uh, ultimately the right will be seen as the force of order and therefore we ultimately win the battle. Great. Uh, we, we have two more questions. So if we come to so Sabina, come to Sabina and, then and then to Alexandra. Then to Alexandra. I'll be very quick. Um, uh, hi, uh, Paolo. Very interesting uh, talk. Um, I think my question is somewhat similar to Christian's, actually. I was interested in hearing about your thoughts on how um, this protectionist discourse relates to nationalism. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, I, who is actually being protected uh, here? And the extent to which you think maybe that what COVID has done is that um, it, it has made this protectionist discourse more nationalist, as opposed to say, um, you know, the other examples that you were using in relation to environment, which have been led by more, more well, not necessarily global actors, but certainly actors that have been more uh, cosmopolitan in their um, uh, ideology and, and thinking. Yes, I mean, one key concept in the book I didn't mention in the initial summary is endopolitics versus exopolitics. So the idea that neoliberalism was very much a politics of the outside projected from uh, the local unit to the other units, right? Uh, and you can see that in the imaginary of outsourcing, export, offshoring, right? There is this obsession in the neoliberal imaginary with spreading out the sprawl itself, right? And then creating the problem of the outsiders, right? Because as you, in a way, uh, uh, expel things outward move. Well, now the imaginary is insourcing, actually a term that was used by Q Starmer in reference to the NHS debate, uh, criticizing the failure of uh, uh, subcontracting, right, and consultants. So uh, that is one element that I think explains this return of the nation that was already evident after 2008, 
and I think I already witnessed it in social movements where the focus, the kind of identity framework moved from the global to the national. And uh, the phase of crisis of globalization of the 2010s, right, uh, in a sense that Brexit and Trump were not, I mean, they were irrational moments, right, uh, or, or for people like me, they were, but they were reflecting something that was going on in, in societies. The fact that the global project was failing and people were in an identity crisis looking for, for something new. More so during the pandemic crisis, I think this has become apparent because nations have in a way been forced to close their borders, right, for health reasons. They've been forced to implement policy very much at the national scale. Actually, attempts to of supranational coordination of policy have not fared very well. Look at the EU vaccination program, which was a failure because uh, fundamentally uh, the the priority was saving money, right? Let's save money on on vaccines, as if vaccines were, were candy, right? And 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 because of the priority being saving money, ultimately uh, companies decided to prioritize other customers who were willing to pay more. So in this context, uh, I think uh, the matter is, um, in a way, accepting the stubbornness of a national identity and the stubbornness of the nation state as something that exists and will exist in the medium term, right? I don't know if, if Mazzini's uh, prophecy about the human family one day coming together at the end of history will come true, but say... Uh, as Keynes says, in the long term, we are all dead. So I think in our lifetime, we will need to deal with this uh, fact. And I think dealing with this existence of the nation is actually the only way to construct a realistic internationalism, right? To understand that there are national identities, there are national interests, there is uh, competition going on. Uh, because for too long, supranationalism has been a cover for continuing to do the same thing while shrouding it in uh, um, cosmopolitan progressivism. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, so please go ahead, Alexander. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, um, I'm sorry if I missed bits of it. I was listening to you on the 4G on the way back home, but I, I hope the question doesn't reflect that. Secondly, I'm not a conversation analyst. Uh, I'm working on anarchism in political theory, political thought, politics, and I'm interested in security and I'm uh, involved in the security studies program. So that's kind of background. Now, with that in mind, what I want to share is perhaps more of a comment, and I hope it's coherent, And but I want to put it as a, 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 to you because I'm interested in your reflections. So, for example, communes you just mentioned from the new left, you know, don't work. I'm not sure the state works either, precisely if you look at all the things that are threatened and that people need protecting from, in a, se in a sense, now. From an anarchist perspective, we mm -hmm. need to be protected from the state. The state doesn't protect us, for, for, for one, and for, for, for an from another angle, the state, of course, is a very powerful institution. It is able to protect particular interests, which is why the elite are very good at using its levers, for example. But it's not the only institution. They will use multinational corporations, Davos. They will use supranational institutions to further their particular interests, to protect their particular interests. Devolution will be flagged as something that people you know, um, need for their own protection from whoever is further away. And so I suppose what I'm trying to grasp towards it kind of I'm, I'm curious because you framed it all as a return of the state. And I can, I'm not, by the way, uh, this is fascinating what you said. I'm not questioning what you said in, in the slightest. I'm just interested <laughs> in your thoughts on this, because maybe it's not just the state. It's a, it's a graph towards, I don't know, the agents, the institutional agents that we're familiar with, that people are familiar with, in particular that the bourgeois and the powerful are familiar with. Um, and so it, 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 those do get reinforced, and the state is a prime one among these, but not necessarily the only one, which is also, by the way, why anarchists are going to react to the, to the whole situation, the pandemic, by organizing the way they do against the state instead of the state, parallel to the state, just as the bourgeoisie don't act only through the state, they'll act through, again, Davos, etc. So I'm just 
just curious about kind of the expanding it beyond just the state um, as 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 institutions that can protect us, even if officially it's the state, because that's the only legitimate institution politically, perhaps. But in mm -hmm. practice, all these other institutions that have long been used the, the, through which power can be exercised get reinforced as well. I don't know. It's a bit messy. I'm sorry, but I'm interested in your thoughts no on this. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, uh, no, uh, I was thinking there was another question after yours. Yes, I mean, indeed. I mean, th the reason why people are suspicious of state interventionism uh, is because, as Ralph Miliband said about the state in capitalist societies, uh, the most frequent use of state intervention is to maintain the powers that be, the economic powers that be. I mean, I think this is fundamental. This is the epiphanic mod mo moment of the new statism. Because in 2008, it became apparent that all the things that had been said for 30 years about the self-regulating market, about freedom of enterprise, about uh, competition, were red herrings. Right? It was crystal clear that those companies' survival was possible because in moments of trouble, the, the state would come and help them. And that the state would create as German or, or the liberals have long said, markets are dependent on the ability of the state to regulate markets and therefore create markets by regulating them. But once you understand that capitalism is there because the state is supporting it, it also opens the possibility that the state may be used in a different manner. And I think that is really what now uh, people are realizing. I mean, there is a, a return of a sense of political possibility. While for years they told us that basically politics couldn't do anything but manage the inevitable course of history, right? Turning upside down the kind of modernist vision of politics as a construction of history. Now, as a kind of neo modernist, I would say, uh, spirit, a spirit of uh, planning, which is coming back, right? When you say 2013, no petrol cars that is mandatory planning is like almost Soviet style, right? So all these things are think are charting a very different imaginary for the future going forward uh, for uh, for everyone. Then obviously, I mean, uh, actually statism is a term that was coined by Bakunin, right? I mean, anarchists have been very good in theorizing the state and they've actually taught us many important things about the state. I still think that though the kind of the problem of political authority is not something that anarchist theory ever resolved because different stages of civilizations are, are but different forms of the state uh, to be made. The empire state, the city state, the nation state. Uh, so in a way, uh, dealing with, with authority and creating democratic authority to me remains the kind of only normatively from a normative perspective remains the, the only kind of feasible uh, way uh, to improve uh, the conditions of the many as it were.